Sunday we started a message, a series called Love One Another. And uh, the title for last week's message was Pray for Simon. And I remember we were talking about Simon the sorcerer, who, even though he was a sorcerer when he heard the gospel, he dropped everything, he dropped his sorcery and began to he accepted Jesus Christ and began to follow Philip. However, because of his fears and his insecurities, he ended up looking for a way to get the anointing as quickly as possible by asking uh, for it to be sold to him and he was rebuked for this. Last week, the conclusion was that we should pray for Simon rather than just wave him off. He's a young believer, he's a new believer. We were once like the Simons of this world, but Jesus would never push us away. He would give us a chance to be taught, to be strengthened, and to know the truth and be delivered from our fears and insecurities. Today, the title of the next in the series is Love is the commandment for life, or love the commandment for life. In life, one of the most prevalent emotions is fear. Fear is the main reason that people do things that they would ordinarily not do. Things which they knew, if they understood that they have authority and power over fear, they would definitely behave differently. And law, fear is the opposite of faith. We are Christians. We are born by faith. We are made by faith. We, are, we give our life to Christ by faith. It's not by logic. It's not by understanding. Faith requires no understanding. And because it requires no understanding, it actually leaves no room whatsoever for fear because fear is based on understanding. Some people have created an acronym for it that goes this way. False evidence appearing real. Faith does not require evidence. That is one of the most interesting things about faith. The work we have been called to is a work of faith, a work that requires no evidence whatsoever. So it is the direct opposite of fear because fear is based on evidence, your circumstances, your doubts, the way things look around you make you reach a conclusion that you should be afraid. But faith says, whether I see anything or not, I believe. Hallelujah. Faith is about belief and this is the work God has called us into. Today we are talking about love as the commandment for life. In John chapter 13, please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 13 and we'll read two verses only. Verses 34 and 35. I pray in the name of Jesus that every one of us will be set free today. Amen. Will be liberated from the power of fear. Because the word of God says, when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Fear will no longer be our motivating factor for life. And this is God's ultimate goal, that fear will not be what motivates us, but faith and love. Hallelujah. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here the word of God says, by this shall men know that we are his disciples. If this is how men will know that we, are, we belong to Jesus, if, this is, if it is true love that we show towards each other and towards people everywhere, that men will know that we are his disciples or his followers. How will God himself know that we are his? Think about it. If he says it's by way of love, the love we show to each other, that men will know that we belong to him. How will God himself know that we belong to him? I believe it's also by this means. By this also, by love. 
This shows that as far as God is concerned, love, loving others is a commandment. Even as we are told, it says, a new commandment I give you. It is something he watches out for. It is a commandment. And a commandment is not a matter of choice, but obligation. I want you to take note of that. A commandment is not a matter of choice, but obligation. You have to do it. If you want to be his, you have to do it. If we are not prepared to accept that commandment, then we are saying practically we don't want to be his. Another point we notice that to love here, it says love one another. In short, to love one another means that the benefit of this commandment is not directed at ourselves, but others. There is a benefit in loving. Love one another. But the benefit is not for us. It's for others. So we consciously make efforts to love others while leaving it to others to also make efforts to love us. Praise the Lord. Amen. We consciously, because we know it's a commandment, we consciously love others in order to obey God, in order to show that we love God also. Because he said, if you love me, obey my commandment. We want to show God that we love him. So we consciously make efforts to love others while leaving it to others to make efforts to love us. If you fear that they won't love you, the solution is to make it your prayer that they should love you. Hallelujah. Amen. If you are afraid that, oh, if I love others with all my heart and all my soul and everything I have, all my possessions, what if others don't love me back? There is a simple solution. Make it your prayer. Say, Lord, give others a heart to love you, to show their love for you by loving me back, by blessing me back the way I bless them and bless you. So the only way to be a good Christian is to daily take steps of love for the benefit of others. Jesus said, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do to me. So when we show love to others, we are actually showing love to Jesus. And if it is our desire to please God, in fact, if it is our desire to spend eternity with him, our question should always be, am I a loving person? Is my church a loving church? How can I love more? How can I help my church to be a loving church in the community? What must I do in order to love others? And to what extent must I go to love? This should be the kind of questions we ask ourselves. All these questions boil down to one simple question. How? How do I love others? How do we love others? Maybe you are saying to yourself now, Lord, show me the way. Jesus already said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. The way to love others. The truth about loving others and the example of a life of loving others is Jesus Christ. He is the answer. We may think it's difficult to love others. In fact, I, I believe that people think it's simple. Let's start with that. Let's, let's first look at it from a very superficial perspective. People think, oh, I care about people. I love, right? But let us look at what Jesus means. He says, I am the way. I am the light. I am the truth. All everything you want to know about love, I am. To demonstrate this, Jesus gave us a parable that we all know, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I do not want to read the parable because we all know that parable. The man was walking down the road, he was riding on his donkey and he saw somebody by the roadside, somebody who had been robbed and wounded and left for dead. And he, this man, this Samaritan stopped and he looked after the man who was sick. I want to talk about the lessons that Jesus told us because Jesus told this parable in answer to a question, who is my neighbor? Because that same person who asked that question had said that I am supposed to love God with all my heart and love my neighbor as myself. But my problem is, who is really my neighbor? Jesus told him that parable. Now, the main lesson of that parable is that our love is meant for other people. In that parable, we read that the Samaritan stopped 
unlike others who had passed by, the Samaritan stopped. He took out his oil. He poured it on the man to suit him. He poured, brought his wine. He gave him some to drink. He gave him his wine to drink in order to strengthen him and revive him. And then he placed this stranger, this wounded man by the roadside on his donkey. In short, he sacrificed and denied himself everything. He denied himself everything that was giving him comfort and joy on that journey. You see, the journey that that Samaritan was making was the journey of life. And what he did in the course of that journey was he met somebody by the roadside, somebody he never knew at all. And the oil that was meant for his own preservation and restoration, he gave it to that man. The wine that he had kept for his own pleasure and for his own merriment, he sacrificed it, he gave it to that man. The donkey that was meant to carry him and carry his burdens on the journey of life, he, he, placed, he, he came down from it and placed the man of it on it. In short, he sacrificed all these for a random stranger, one that he found to be in need on the road of the journey of life. We are not strangers to each other, but we are members of one body. And God says, love one another. He says, by this shall men know that you are mine. Love is the banner by which we will be, that the, 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 the flag, the banner we carry, that we show everybody. We don't need to open our mouth. Our actions will speak for us. Our love. And God is saying, Jesus says, it's the new law. Do you know that before this law, there were ten commandments? And Jesus crystallized everything, summed up everything into just to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your strength, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the law that God has given to the church and the law by which we will be judged. I want us to look at James chapter 2 from verses 8 to 12. Today we are going to be looking at a lot of scriptures. I believe that we are people who have heard all the stories in the Bible. We have, If we say let us read another parable or anything, we are used to it. But well, let us look at the principles, the doctrines by which we must live. James chapter 2. We'll read from verse 8. I will skip one verse only and read to verse 12. Verse 8 says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, then you do well. But Verse 10, I go straight to verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So speak ye, and so do. Speak and do. Speak and behave as somebody who knows that he is going to be judged by the law of liberty. The law of liberty is the, is the law of love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Hallelujah. Amen. He said we should live our lives as people who know that we are going to be judged by this law. Do you know you are going to be judged by the law of love? You are not going to be judged by how much you prayed. Actually, you are not going to be judged by how close you were to God in life. By your own assessment. You are not going to be judged. This is the word of God we just read. James chapter 2 verse 12. It says we are not going to be judged by anything. But by the law of liberty. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And he says love one another. This is the commandment that I have given you. Each day that we wake up, God gives us another opportunity to practice the perfect law. The perfect law of loving our neighbors. The perfect law of loving one another with the same love that we have for ourselves. As long as you love, care and think about yourself, you should redirect all that love to others. Wow. 
Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 also tells us, shows us that love is the ministry of the members of the body of Christ. Love is the ministry. In that Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 12 to 13, we are told that God gave gifts. He gave all the gifts, the ministries in the church for this one purpose that we find in verse 13. He says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Hallelujah. Amen. The word of God says that we all need, we all we come together in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. A perfect man. Our goal is to become perfect. And the only way we can be perfect is to be perfect in obeying the law. The one, the, 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 sim, the simple law that is called the law of love. Beloved, love is the ministry of the members of the body of Christ. Love is the purpose for which Jesus, God, Jesus has come to raise a family for God. Love is the purpose for which the church gathers. And the, the the, the, the garden of the church should be meant for training, equipping, refreshing believers in preparation for the ministry of love. So in everything we do, we should always think, we should always ask ourselves, am I loving? Am I obeying this one commandment? Forget about every other commandment. Don't think about them, because if you think about them, it will look like, oh, how am I going to obey all this? Let's take for instance, thou shalt not covet. Think about it. Do you not covet? Do you not want what others have? That is covetousness. That is coveting. But God tells us there is a way to resolve the problem. The problems that the laws, the commandments, the Ten Commandments and all the laws that of, of, of the, the Old Testament. All the laws that they give them is a simple solution, an antidote to the problems they may bring to us. And that antidote is love. And therefore, the church gathering our gathering is meant to be for training, for equipping, for refreshing us in preparation for the ministry of love. If all our prayers, all our Bible studies, all our preaching, if they do not result in believers loving one another, then our gathering is in vain. And it is not unto the Lord. If, the, if our prayers and our Bible studies and our preaching and everything we do, leave us the same way that we can be like the Levite or the priest in the, in the story of the Samaritan who saw a wounded man and they walked by who saw a hungry man and they walked by who saw a naked man and they walked by if our going to church if our praying and our Bible studies and our, our preaching everything we do only leaves us like that then our gathering is in vain and not unto the Lord Christianity is life living as the visible and manifest image of God daily and knowing that everything that we have he allows us to have so that we can use them on his behalf as his manifest image God is love God is love and we are to manifest that love we are to you see God is not going to come here physically in, in person but he depends on us to do it his word tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that he had a hope in us the hope that he had in the saints. And that hope is that we will represent him. We will represent him. We will be him on earth. Everywhere we go, we will be, we'll be doing the things that he would love to do. Can we use all the time, all the money, all the possessions, all our effort, all our strength, can we use them on God's behalf? Would we like to use them? Would you like to use all your money? all your time ask yourself that question and get an answer right now what is your answer to the question would you like to use all your time all your money all your possessions everything you've got would you like to use them on god's behalf probably you will say yes or you may be somebody who will say wow that that is that is difficult because using everything on god's behalf simply means using them to love others giving them to others are you willing to lay everything on the table and say, okay, all the work I did this month, all the money I got this month, 
That is it. That's what was remaining after paying my bills. Now, how can I use all this to work for God? How can I use this? God has given me the opportunity to see this day. How can I use this as if it belonged to God? Because this is what God is asking for. This is where we must start. Whatever else you want to think about, whatever you want to enjoy, whatever prevails in your mind, everything needs to be replaced by this one thought. Can I use all this? My time, my possession and everything, can I use them for God? Because that is his commandment that I should love one and I should love others on his behalf. If you are somebody who is saying that is very hard, I agree with you, it's very hard. But the reason it's hard is because we are the products of our society and our culture. We have been brought up to always think that everything we have is about ourselves. And even though we are in Christ, we continue to do so, continue to think like this. Unfortunately, we do so to our own detriment. And the church has also not helped. Rather, it has helped to reinforce this selfishness through the prosperity gospel that defines success in terms of what we can gather and build for ourselves and our children. So now when we hear the truth that everything we have is not for us but for others, we become scared. We begin to ask ourselves, can anyone really love like this? I want to tell you the truth. You can, even you. You can love like this. God knows our weakness. He knows your weaknesses. And that is why he has given us the Holy Spirit as our helper. We cannot love without him. We cannot work for God without him. We cannot give without him. Even Jesus would, did not go into ministry, did not do anything until the Holy Spirit came upon him to anoint him, to empower him. And he said in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me for this purpose. To show love and care for the rest of the world. Hallelujah. So God has given us his Holy Spirit as, as our helper. He will help us. He will transform us. He will renew our mind. He will give us a new spirit. He will put a new spirit in us. And that is my prayer today. That the Holy Spirit will put a new spirit in you. He will renew a right spirit in you and me. That actually we will go back to the beginning. We will go back to the first love. The purpose of our salvation. The purpose of our being called. Is to reflect God on earth. God is love. God is love. Is God in you? If God is in you, then you are saying that you are love. Hallelujah. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be the true expression of love. But he who began the good work in us, he who began the work of salvation in you and me, he is with us to complete it until the day of Christ. God says, by this men shall know that you are mine. In that you think what is best about yourself. Think what is good for you. Think what you would love to have. Think how you would want people to react to you. If you were if you were by the roadside, if you were in need, if you needed someone to support you. God says, By this man we know that you are his. If you think of what is best for you, and then you begin to bless others, your neighbor with it. It is not impossible. With men, this may be difficult. But with God, all things are possible. And to him who believes, all things are possible. Do you want to love God with all that you have? Do you want to obey that one vital commandment for life? Which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Which is to love others. Which is to start in the household of faith. Which is to begin to understand that everything you have, everything you have belongs to him. And that you, you are prepared to bring them under his control. And that when he speaks to your heart, you will obey. This is the law by which we are going to be judged. According to James chapter 2 verse 12. We need to understand that the church is a melting pot. The church is a melting pot from which we begin to give people the attention. The friendship, the love, the care, the hope, the joy. The support that God promises to everyone in his world. The support that God has promised every one of us as we read this word. He says, it's men that are going to give it to us. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, shall men pour unto your bosom. Shall men give to you. You are the men. You. You and I. We are the men that God is talking about. 
You sow seeds of love. You care about other people. And you, you may be looking up to God and saying, well, God said if I do it, he's going to bless me. God says today, it's men that I'm going to use to bless you. I am going to use you to answer somebody's prayer. I'm going to use someone else to answer your prayer. Beloved, I want you to understand, whatever seed you have in your hand, whatever you have, God made it possible. I know it's difficult to see for many people that, oh, well, I went to work myself. I did everything myself. If I didn't go to work, God gave you the job. God gave you this grace, the, the grace, the strength to be able to go to work. God gave you favor at work. God strengthened you again when you came back from work. God gave you sleep so that you are able to rest and be restored. God is involved in your life. And the reason he's involved in your life is because he wants to use you as his vessel. He wants you to be his ambassador. He wants you to be his representative. He wants you to be the one that he will use to show that attention. People need attention. The world is crying for attention. That is why the social media is full of people book pasting pictures everywhere. Looking for somebody to say, oh, nice picture. You look beautiful. Don't wait until you get to social media before you tell people they are beautiful. Tell them. Look at people and tell you are beautiful. Encourage them. And when you see people are struggling, tell them they are strong. The Bible says, let the weak say that I'm strong. You don't have to wait for the weak to say it by himself. Even when you see the weak, you can say to them, you are strong. Because God is with you. Hallelujah. God wants us to be the ones that we use to love the world. To give them the promises without discrimination, without bias, without prejudice. Just as he did for us. Romans chapter eight, uh, chapter 5 verse 8 says, God commended his love to us. That in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We must not discriminate with our love. We must not look at only our member and the members of our family and think, oh, we are planning for them. No. God is saying to us, love one another. Another way of putting that is plan for one another. Plan for one another. Plan how you will bless each other. As you get your, your, your income, as you get your whatever seed comes your way, whatever money, whatever salary you got, is it possible for you to look at it and say, how can I be a blessing to somebody too? I want you to understand, the moment you start thinking like that, then you engage God. You engage God. You cause God to now realize that you need more supply. Many of us are struggling because we are not giving. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 23 and 24 say, There is one that scattereth and he increases, and there is another that withholds, but he tends to poverty. Hallelujah. Amen. I pray in the name of Jesus that today you will make up your mind to obey the law. The law of love. It is the one command, commandment that God has given us. Today, the whole of the world makes, makes us to believe that if we are able to gather, if we are able to save as much as possible, then we will be rich. We will be able to provide for ourselves. But if you look at the book of Haggai, God says that in chapter 2, that if you, if in chapter 1 to be specific, that when you go and walk, if you do not think about him, even that which we, we will bring home, he will blow it away. Because you belong to him. He gave you the privilege. He gave you the life. So that you can use it to live for him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want us to, in conclusion, I want to give us 10 reasons. Why our life depends on loving one another. 10 reasons. Hallelujah. The first one. Remember when we started this message? When I started, I talked about fear. Fear is the greatest problem. Fear, anticipation of what will happen tomorrow. Not knowing that is one of the reasons why people are selfish on earth. Why people think about themselves. Why they keep everything for themselves in preparation for the unknown. But love, love creates an interdependent family bond which eliminates fear. Interdependence. Love creates interdependence. It creates an interdependent family bond in the family of God. And this eliminates fear. It eliminates worry. If you know that as you are being a blessing to others, that others will be a blessing to you. If you know that there are people around you who will surely bless you, who will surely meet you, 
at your own point of need, then you will not be afraid of giving anymore. And by the way, giving is sowing. When you give, it comes back to you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. It will surely come back. But many of us cannot even sow seeds. The seed that is meant to come back with great harvest in our life. We are afraid of sowing it. We are afraid of sowing it. Because we are thinking that if I, if I sow this now, I may not have again. Then you are calling God a liar. Because he said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Which prayers that shaking together shall men give unto you. You don't need to be afraid. Have faith in God that men will give it to you. Believe and it shall come to pass. So love creates a family bond which eliminates fear, which eliminates worry, doubt, anxiety and competition. These are the things that lead to selfishness. These are the things that lead to limitation and even disappointment, disappointment in our own lives. But love, love gives back to faith and boldness. In Acts chapter 4, verses, verse 31, we are told that the people became bold because they came together and prayed and they shared the things that they have. And because they were sharing and nobody lacked, the conclusion was that the people became confident. They were not worried about tomorrow. They were bold. They were able to exercise faith. There was no case of, oh, what if I exercise faith, faith and it doesn't happen? No, it, there was no such fear because they knew that there were always people there for them. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will see your brothers and your sisters and the church as people that are there for you so that you will be bold enough to exercise faith. You will be bold enough to show love. Number two, love creates care and protection for us. Looking out for one another. The first one, if you want to take down scriptures for it, James chapter 4 verse 1. 1 John chapter 4 verse 18. Which says there is no fear in love. That is very interesting. There is no fear in love. Because perfect love casts away fear. Where there is perfect love among us, we will not be afraid of tomorrow. Because we will know that there is somebody there for me tomorrow. God is there. And by the way, when I say God, sometimes I actually mean your brother and your sister. Because God will manifest through them. So you are not afraid. Perfect love casts away fear. Fear is what has torment. Fear is what scares you. Fear is what makes you selfish. Fear is what brings limitation to you. But the Bible says, perfect love casts away fear. Hallelujah. Love creates care and protection. Looking out for one another is strength. If you know that, if you jump from the mountain top, there are people waiting to catch you, you will not be afraid of jumping. The disciples of Jesus, they understood that Jesus loved them. He cared about them. He, he protected them. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, He said to those who came to pick him, those who came to arrest him, He said to them, I am he that you are looking for. If it's me that you want, then let this go away. That's love. Perfect love protects. He loved his own so much that I said, let these ones go away. You can take me with you, but let these ones go away. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 12 says, Love covers all sins. Another word for sin is weakness, shortcoming. Love covers all sins sins. Jesus saw that his disciples were afraid. I'm not saying that was a sin in itself, even though it is if you want to look at it from another dimension. Because when God is on your side, why should you be afraid? When God is with you, why should you be afraid? But it's true, when we see the circumstances of life, we do get afraid. Jesus saw that his disciples were afraid and he said, let these ones go away. Hallelujah. Love covers all sins. Hallelujah. Number three, God's grace and his rich blessings are always targeted at those who love one another. As we read in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 34, I would like to read that because it's not one of those scriptures that we can just mention or gloss over. We need to read it and remind ourselves of it all the time. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The word of God says, The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. That is love. Neither said any of them that the things that they possessed was their own, but they had all things in common. 
they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I'm still reading from Acts chapter 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of land or of houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And they laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. When you know that there is a place where you come together, the melting pot called the body of Christ, when you know that you belong to such a place, where you know that you can always go whenever you are in need, because you yourself, you have given, you have contributed, you have, you have, you have you've brought what you've got, you've, you've brought all that, your possession, your, your time, your everything, you've brought them. When you know you've brought your possession to the same place, you will not be afraid of going there to receive. And you will not be afraid that tomorrow you may not have. You will know that distribution will be made to you. Distribution will, will, will be made to you according to your need and you will not lack. Hallelujah. The Bible says there will be great grace among us. What is grace? Grace is power, ability. Grace is unmerited favor. When the people of God are together in love, when they are bound together in love, God makes that place a target of his blessings. Hallelujah. Great grace was upon them. Great power and unmerited favor. Hallelujah. The next point is that love gives a sense of belonging to the family. There are many people who are lonely in the world today. Even in the church, many are lonely. The only time they are happy is when they come to church, where they can dance and sing with everybody. And when people say hello to them, but at home, they are alone. Love must not stop in church. It begins in the church. It is a melting pot from which we begin. The church is just the starting point. It is the place we begin. We must carry on. It must flow from beyond the, 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 the church. The word, the word of God says that God has shared his love abroad in our hearts. He has shared it abroad. It means beyond just us. Everywhere. Hallelujah. So we give people a sense of, we give each other a sense of belonging to the family and to the body of Christ. We give them also a sense of responsibility to do service towards each other and towards the community and the world without any fear. Without any fear. Love begs unity. Colossians chapter 3 verse 14 says that unity is the bond of love. Hallelujah. Love brings about unity. No division. Word of God says where the people of God are gathered together in unity. God commands blessing. Without love there can be no unity. Love makes people care and show understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us a lot about love. You can take your time to read that. By the time you read up to verse 10, you will have seen so much about love that you will be astounded. Love creates trust and hope in each other. Love creates trust and hope. We will we'll look at chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians next week. We will look in detail in order to understand what it means for us to obey this one commandment. Love one another. Love begs kindness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, mercy. When there is love, all these things, you people step on your toe. You don't, you don't judge them quickly. The first thing that comes from you is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Just like Jesus Christ. Do you think that Jesus could not see the people that were whipping him? Do you think that Jesus could not see the glee, the joy that was in the faces of these people as they were enjoying beating him and whipping him and nailing him to the cross? He saw all these things, but he saw beyond the physical. He said, he spoke as a spiritual one. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. You might say to me, that was Jesus. Jesus, oh, that Jesus can do all things. Yes. Philip, uh, I, um, the deacon, the first martyr, in the Bible, Stephen, the deacon, he was not Jesus, but he was able to do the same. As he was being stoned to death, he lifted up his eyes 
and to heaven and said, Father, do not hold this against them. Even Apostle Paul said the same thing. He mentioned Demas and many other people that have abandoned him. And he also prayed for them that God will not hold it against them. We must be people who pray for others, who forgive others, who show mercy and patience towards others and say, Father, do not hold this against them. Love is the only way to take our place in the body of Christ. Love cleanses our hearts. Love is very vital. Love is the only power that we have in order to be able to do what God wants us to do. Love is the only way that we sow seeds and get the things that God wants to give us. Love is so important. And God is love. God is love. We are made in His image. As the visible and, visible and manifest image of God who is love. And love is our banner. Love is a commandment. Love brings peace. Peace on which we are able to thrive and to prosper. As Christians, I want to remind us today that love is all that we must focus on. If you love others, you cannot rob others. If you love others, you cannot trample on others. If you love others, you cannot disregard others. If you love others, you cannot cheat others. If you love others, you will show that love towards them. You will share with them. If you love others, you cannot be arrogant towards them. If you love others, the only thing that would always be in your mind is how you love yourself. And that is the, high, the, the lowest standard by which God wants us to go. How would you love yourself? How, how would you love yourself? Would you love to be forgotten, uh, to be forgiven? If you love to be forgiven, forgive others. As Christians, that is the debt that we owe each other. It is a debt that we must pay all the days of our lives. But it is also a debt that can never be fully paid until the end of our lives. And where love is absent, there is only fear suspicion, selfishness, and sin. I pray today that God will make his love to abound towards you. And that that love, as it fills you, you will also, he will also cause it to abound through you towards other believers and towards all men. I want you to lift up your voice and pray today. Father, I want to obey your law of love. I surrender my life to you. Lord, let your love Fill me today. Let your Holy Spirit help me to become a visible and manifest image of your love in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for this word that you have given to us today. Lord, you want us to know that law is the law. It is the commandment by which we are going to be judged. Today, we have not spent our time looking in detail as to how to love. But we have looked at why it is important to love. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to speak to our hearts. Help us to be Berean. Help us to be people who are doers of your word. Lord, let us not be people who just hear. Help us to understand that our life, our freedom, our prosperity, all depend on loving one another. But I ask in the name of Jesus, and as we understand this, we also release unto us the grace to begin to plan for each other, to begin to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.